Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Designing Fresh Websites That Motivate Visitors to Convert. My name is Casey Murphy. I'm the Director of Marketing here at SiteTuners and I'm happy to have you here. We, every month we put on webinars that teach you new and exciting ways to increase conversions on your site and today's, today's session is just going to be packed full of information so I know people are still logging in but I, we want to get started because it's a very full day. We're going to be recording the session so if you have to step out or take a phone call, which we hope you won't do, then no worries. We'll send you a link afterwards. You'll also get a link to the full slide deck to, uh, that'll be sent to all registered attendees. If you'd like to tweet, and we hope you do, please use the hashtag for today, motivate, motivate web, hashtag motivate web on Twitter, and let your friends know that you are tuned in. So at this point, I'd like to kick it off by sending the introducing you to Tim Ash, today's host and moderator. Many of you know Tim as the chair of Conversion Conference, CEO of Site Tuners, and of course, author of Landing Page Optimization, the Bible in the conversion optimization space. So Tim, take it away. Oh, well, thanks, Casey. Wow, the Bible. I think I've been promoted. Um, so today we have a very exciting webinar, um, and we're going to try to bring a fresh perspective to you. Again, please tweet the crap out of this. Uh, hashtag motivate web. If you like it, don't like it, let us know. Also, a reminder that uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll be doing a Q&A. So there's a, a question window that you have as part of your control panel. Go ahead and... Uh, start you know, putting your questions in there as you as they come up during the presentation we'll try to get to as many of them as we can at the end okay um, so I want to introduce today's presenters we have Tony Brinton and Julia Sloan from Motivate Design they're a New York based agency that uh, is at the top of the game in, in usability and user experience and again we thought we'd bring their perspective to you so Without any further ado, I just want to uh, introduce uh, or welcome uh, Tony and Julia, and guys, take it away. Thanks very much, Tim. Let me uh, switch over here. Hopefully everybody can see my screen okay. We sure can. Okay, great. So as Tim mentioned, uh, Tony Brinton and... Uh, Got my colleague Julia, Julia Sloan here. Um, we're both uh, designers at an uh, experience design agency in New York City called Motivate Design. Um, I'm also a part-time lecturer at uh, Parsons, the new school for design. And uh, Julia is an alumnus from the same program from which I'm currently teaching a, sen a senior seminar in disruptive design thinking. Um, we're both really passionate about user experience design as an important component of a successful brand experience. And today, um, we're really going to focus on some of the you know, finer design uh, aspects and some of the movements that we see happening in user experience design that we feel strongly have uh, a big impact on people's willingness and uh, uh, desire to engage with websites and all that that leads to conversions. Okay, so this next slide is showing an overview of all of the different disciplines that go into this practice, user experience design. It's a relatively young design discipline. Uh, there's a lot of different things that go into it. Uh, into a great user experience, so therefore it's, it's fairly complicated. Um, so it's taken a while for this discipline to evolve. Kind of a brief history here. Uh, the first wave of web design, it just wasn't very human. And as Aaron Walter in his book on design for emotion uh, stated, we just weren't really designing so much for people as we were machines. Uh, during that first wave, but something happened, you know, after the first dot-com wave, and it was probably in the middle of the 2000s or so. I mean, there's obviously some technological advancements that were taking place that allowed for, you know, bigger and greater things to happen, but uh, the, the thing that we really uh, noticed is that design just became more personal and more emotional. Uh, in short, we sort of decided to start designing more for people. Um, 
why did it take so long? So technology was maybe part of it. But like I said, UX design for the web was and is an evolving practice. So designers working on personal projects after that first dot-com bubble burst could be uh, one reason that um, you started seeing some, some newer, uh, more interesting things happening. Um, bosses weren't breathing down their neck, this and that. And they were just kind of, well, how should this really be done? Um, social media, I think, really had something to do with it also. Uh, you know, just giving a voice to people and, you know, having that collective voice sort of start shaping people's perceptions around uh, authenticity and, and more of a genuine experience coming through on the web. And a lot of those uh, sensibilities being picked up by web designers and injected into the designs. Um, so overall, designers just became better at what they do. And as the design became more human, we started to see a lift in engagement, trust, and conversions. Um, you know, also with that, people's expectations of user experience grew. So with that, we'd like to take you few, through a few current UX design movements that we feel are helping humanize people's experience with interactive media. And they're, they're again, you know, following the premise that that will lead to an increased uh, engagement and conversions on site. So the first movement that we'd like to call out is just, you know, design for emotion in general. And I'll let Julia speak to this next slide a little bit. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? We can. Great. Right. Um, so with this designing for emotion, um, our field and user experience uh, really was originally rooted in some of the is it was in usability, and we really wanted to focus on that just because something is usable and useful doesn't mean it's emotional or emotionally engaging. Um, if your product or service or app or website may be the most informative or efficient portal, that will only tap into a, really a small portion of your us user's emotional engagement. Um, there's pieces of us that are hard to quantify and, and more emotional in nature that can be very powerful components when of dealing with the user interactions. So really both design and business people alike are now realizing this, which has resulted in a, another facet of what we do and, and eventually a, a buzzword, so designing user engagement rather than just user experiences. Um, and really this reflects the true dynamic participation of people in the products and services they use these days. It's become ingrained in the part of who they are. Um, this is actually a quote from the Harvard Business Review that I think summed this up pretty nicely in a simple way. So to make a vulgar comparison, just because someone buys a lot of books doesn't mean those books are read. Uh, just because someone has a lot of friends doesn't mean those friendships are nurtured, cultivated, or honored. So really there's, there's so much, there's such a deeper relationship with the products, services, brands that we use every day that we now are beginning to try to tap into those through design methodologies and, um, yes. <laughs> Great. Um, so as Tony had mentioned, social media as a whole has kind of exposed the digital world to a new level of honesty and authenticity. Uh, no longer is it appropriate to feel like you're talking to a machine or a device, but should be rather a person um, that has feelings and opinions. So that honesty, that transparency that social media brought has found its way into the personalities of many new businesses. It becomes ingrained and entrenched in, in, their, in their model. So, and users are now beginning to expect this on the websites and applications they visit, uh, some type of personality that they can relate to and feel like they know. Uh, there's several ways that this can be accomplished through design techniques. Um, the images we show here are a couple of insurance websites, and you can see the one on the left feels very um, dark and cold and not easy to relate to, whereas the one on the right seems very modern and approachable and friendly. So rich, bold visual experiences can help uh, communicate this message, as well as um, human language, so feeling like you're directly talking to your user, a little more colloquial and friendly, not as um, kind of sterile. 
So a lot of you language, for instance, you can see in the tagline there, healthcare expertise for you and your uh, bottom line. So really feeling like the business is, is talking to me, it makes me feel important. Uh, it brings that personal approach. Also kind of a less cluttered and chaotic and more focused experience. Um, no longer are businesses trying to sell to users as hard. Of course, that's a bottom line goal, but not being so obvious about it. So really not trying to cram as many offerings into space on a page, but uh, thinking about uh, the experience as a whole. That's good. So those la last couple points lead us into our next movement that we want to call out, which is really having to do more with simplicity. Um, so here we're showing a screenshot from a website called Wantful, and this is a terrific site that really helps you um, approach the subject of personal gifts in a whole new way. Uh, what they've done here is really stripped away a lot of what is unnecessary and focused on what's important. They've used contrast to draw attention to the most important elements on the screen. and you know, one thing that we're seeing with what we feel to be are some of the most successful experiences out there that are really designed to drive conversions is a very strong value proposition and a very clear call to action. So in this case, that's demonstrated through, you know, the, the lead image here at the top again, kind of nice, rich, bold Im imagery uh, with the strong call to action, create the perfect, perfect birthday gift and get started. Simple as that. Um, so the size of elements on screen uh, has been increased to be more simple. The type is bigger. The form elements and the buttons and things like that, these are all trends that we're seeing uh, to help simplify designs and just make them feel more approachable. Uh, this design in particular also uses simplified iconography and uh, continuous scrolling um, through pages, long pages that are chunked out to kind of have one focus message display at a time as you're scrolling through it is another trend that uh, we see uh, quite a bit with some of the nicer sites out there and we'll be looking at a few examples of that today as well but I think Wantful is, is one of those sites that employs that method. So the next movement then uh, has to do with storytelling so um, you know one way that we just mentioned is you know through the the great uses of continuous scrolling these days, but um, you know it kind of pulls together a lot of uh, different aspects of effective communication also. So this example, this example is uh, Harry's, and this is a direct-to-consumer boutique company offering men's shaving accessories. It uh, started by the co-founder of Warby Parker, which is a differentiated eyewear company that's really disrupted the industry in some ways. Um, we'll talk about them a little bit later, but this is another venture of theirs that uh, we just love how they're presenting themselves online. They've really given careful thought to compelling narrative through simple, clean design that's you know, clearly inspired by the same design principles that a company like Apple follows. Um, it's a simplified design and it's uh, delivered through these focus content mod modules through a continuous scroll. So I'm just going to click on this now and bring up the site really quickly so we can just demonstrate some of this. So here we see you know, nice value propositions, some support points here. As we scroll down the page, there's just a few thoughts at a time that are uh, being given here, so I'm not sure it's rendering quite in real time, so I'm slowing down a little bit as that's rendering through the GoToWebinar, but hopefully you get the idea there. So I'm going to switch back to the presentation. Uh, in any event, the storytelling on Harry's is just terrific. I'd encourage all of you to spend a little time on that site just to kind of admire how well they're doing it as they're describing um, the products themselves through the product detail pages, but they've also got a great section just talking about the story behind the brand, and they use similar uh, techniques to 
kind of let that story unfold. So the next movement would be, you know, content. Content is king. We've all heard that for uh, a very long time, but I think this is one of those principles that uh, has stayed true and will continue to stay true um, for the <laughs> foreseeable future. Uh, we've we've got an example of Evernote here. In this case, you know, content content, you know, I think can be translate as, as substance. So whether that's your product or your offer or the actual content on your site, um, you know, it's got to, you have to start with a good product that people want. So clearly Evernote is one of those products that just served a big need from a lot of people and they've had a lot of success around this, but we just love how they portray themselves online. It's a very strong call, uh, value proposition and they've sort of position this in a creative way. Just remember everything. It's really taking some time to kind of boil down uh, your core value proposition into its essence and being able to uh, communicate that in a memorable way. And then they've got a you know, very easy to understand um, highlight of some kind of key features of the app and then get Evernote for free is sort of the strong call to action there. So we think this is uh, very effective and done, you know, with a nice uh, eye towards the personal touch and kind of the craft of design. So if content is king, context is God. This is something I heard Brian Halligan say. Uh, he's the CEO of HubSpot. Uh, he gave a keynote at their Inbound 12 conference last August, and this statement really stuck with me. Um, we all know that serving up the right message in the right place at the right time can dramatically improve the likelihood of conversion. And today, while we're talking mostly about you know, some user experience design principles and movements that are uh, influencing users' engagement and uh, conversions, this is one uh, area that we wanted to sneak in here. Um, it's a little more on the technology side, but uh, the idea of having your calls to action be contextual and this notion of progressive profiling are kind of uh, new things that we're seeing surface more and more. So on the contextual call to action side, um, there, the one way of looking at that is to just make sure you're placing your calls to action um, in places where they relate to the content of the of the page, which is great, but adding another dimension of context which uh, factors in people's behavior on your site and being able to track them and know that, uh, you know, being able to turn, uh, distinguish return visitors from new visitors can impact what you want to serve when and if they've already converted on one of your calls to action, being able to control whether or not that same call to action is then again served to them. You kind of want to avoid that. So here we're kind of trying to demonstrate this idea by saying a conversion number one may be, you know, in Motivate Design's uh, uh, world, it may look something like, hey, get started with ethnography, um, download this white paper. So the first time they convert, they may get a form returned that asks for some simple personal information. So that's great. You go ahead and capture that as a lead and you nurture it um, how, however you do. You know, send out some automatically triggered emails, all those good uh, best practices there. And then, or they may just return to your site uh, at a later time on their own uh, volition. And when they do, you can identify them as having already converted. So. Uh, you may serve them up calls to action that would be a good next step in the sales funnel. It may relate to um, the thing that they converted on before. So in this case, it would be another paper on ethnography, but uh, assuming that they've already got some basic information on it, you might want to uh, share some deeper insights. So when they convert on that, the form that's returned wouldn't be the exact same form that they received the first time. I think we've all uh, been through that experience and felt a little frustrated with it. You know, there's a lot of great content that uh, business might be offering, uh, but having to fill out the same form every time, I don't know, it sort of takes a 
withdraw out of the bank of trust and kind of makes you wonder, <laughs> are you going to get twice the emails now or um, something like that. So this progressive profiling is a way to kind of build your profile around your lead database and get to know them a little better every time and it sends the message that, hey, we're watching, we're listening, we know who you are and we really care and, um, you know, it's just good relationship building. Okay, so that's kind of a good segue into another concept of gradual engagement, which um, I'm sure good many of you have uh, been hearing things about for a couple years now. Uh, this is another favorite quote of mine from that inbound conference last year um, during Gary uh, Vaynerchuk's keynote. This guy was hilarious. Uh, but he likened most marketers' approach to that of like a 17-year-old guy uh, because too often they just try to close on the first move, right? So uh, more graceful user experiences employ a method known as gradual engagement to ease users into their product or service. So by doing so, they reduce the chances of scaring people away by asking too much from them in the beginning. And Julia has come up with a, one good example uh, we think of a company that's kind of employing this strategy. So uh, a fairly new app that came out called Polar, which um, is quick quiz taking. So again, they have a very clear, strong value proposition for signups or in their introductory screen. And they allow their users to really engage with their app before they force them to sign any sign up, fill out any form, uh, put offer any information. They really want them to kind of fall in love with it. And then they ask them for their information. Um, when you are immediately faced with a bunch of sign-up forms, it's really not the most welcoming experience. It can be kind of abrupt, and you can feel a little unsure. What am I going to get out of this? What are you going to do with this? Uh, people guard it, and they really want to trust you before they give it out. So thinking, about a, thinking carefully about a good time to ask for it is really vital now. Um, they want to know it's a fair trade. So really, of course, content should be good, but they should really try to kill it with your sign-up form and make it good and simple and, and friendly um, with wider text fields and clear um, labeling. Uh, keep it as simple as possible would be our expert opinion. And you can always ask for more information later, but you don't want to turn them off before they can really really engage. Um, and then make sure what you're asking them is in line with what they're getting. Uh, the more top of the funnel content, the less you should be asking for in terms of information uh, and vice versa. So the common theme in the trends that we're highlighting here is really that we're designing for people more and more. Uh, we're going to now take you through a handful of sites and apps that serve as good examples for some of the movements that we've touched on here, and they all kind of exhibit different aspects of those. Um, I think we're making pretty good time. We're probably going to try to uh, whiz through these examples as quick as we can so we have a little time for questions at the end. Okay, so Julia, what can you tell us about the first couple? <laughs> so really, um, imagery is being used in a more and more important role in the digital world, in the digital experience. Um, people now expect experiences that really pop and uh, grab their eye and grab their attention and, and feel engaging. So we see people scroll through pages and pages of blogs and social networks and um, the likes of Instagram and Pinterest, they just go and go. So brands should really embrace that behavior take advantage of people's new uh, interactions with a page um, and really try to create a visceral, emotive experience around design, which is something that everyone cares about. So that's something that we really try to do. Uh, again, another example, this is the HBO Go homepage. And it really, there's, there's very little text on the page, but you get the idea of what they're trying to communicate. So this ability to communicate now through imagery seems to transcend everything for businesses. We see uh, storytelling through iconography, uh, more slideshows, more uh, brand imagery, just people concentrating a lot on that uh, for every type of 
company, even Facebook, we've seen a site that we all use there um, focus on larger, stronger images of timeline photos. The new focus in, on that is something that's very telling. Um, also, the, the ratio of, of emotional success is much higher with imagery than words. You can, you can get a, a point across quicker. You can make people feel more quicker. So there's, just, there's so much power with that. Um, one example is the Apple site. Uh, you don't feel like you're looking at a picture of, say, an iPad. You feel like you're looking at an actual iPad which is uh, one less layer of consciousness you have to go through to imagine yourself using it. Um, look at it. You feel like you're looking at the real thing versus kind of a picture of it. It's that, that raw experience, and it's eliminating a barrier of, um, of owning it or using it. OK, so this might be the word of the day for some of you, skeuomorphism. <laughs> um, what it means is the use of metaphors from the physical world to uh, kind of help us understand uh, you know, a user interface and, and you know maybe the, the way it functions and what its intentions are. Um, there's two camps really in the design world when it comes to skeuomorphism. Some people are really in favor of it. Other people um, are thinking that as a whole we should be getting away from it a little bit. Um, this sort of debate has been going on within Apple for a long time. Um, that's why some of their apps you would, if you're an Apple user, you would notice that uh, they look, you know, really one way. They look like, you know, they're trying to emulate uh, objects from the familiar world, the physical world, like leather textures and little torn uh, pieces of paper and lined paper and uh, things like that, whereas other apps, you know, are much more minimal and much more functional and kind of have a sleek design to them. The uh, design team over at Apple is currently consolidating with this less is more principle kind of prevailing. Um, this iPad or iPod app, rather, that we're showing on this slide uh, shows kind of the before and after to depict this transition. So on the left-hand side, the last iteration of this before they decided to really uh, do away with a lot of the skeuomorphism is using a lot of, uh, you know, kind of extraneous uh, imagery emulating, you know, metaphors from the real world about uh, recording via media. I mean, it's got a reel-to-reel -reel, uh, tape recorder looking playhead in there, and it's got a lot of uh, you know shadows on on buttons, and uh, even the icons it's using um, for the playback speed. I think it is. Is there's there's a tortoise and a hare. I mean, they really are going out there with that design. And the one to the right is the recently redesigned iPod app that is much more minimal. The the main uh, area within the center of the app is just reserved for the cover art for that actual iPod uh, uh, broadcast. Anyway, so skeuomorphism, here's another example of it that uh, uh, Julia found. I think this is really an excellent job of uh, demonstrating both uh, extreme ends of the spectrum. She's going to talk to this real quick. Uh, so these are two. Uh, mobile apps, uh, Clear and Do It Tomorrow, which are, as Tony mentioned, kind of extreme examples of skeuomorphism and anti-skeuomorphism. So Do It Tomorrow is on the left, and it really exhibits some extremely skeuomorphic lined paper, the handwritten style, the coffee stain, which is just incredibly unneeded. It doesn't deliver anything. There's no use for it at all. Uh, versus clear, which is kind of the opposite end of the design spectrum, which is using design elements such as you know color, weight, um, scale to to get their point across. So instead of having say an alarm clock to mark urgency, which would be the easy way out, they're using uh, shades of red to to display them. So it's very flat. It's extremely minimal. Um, it strips away unneeded elements, even interactive elements such as buttons and kind of uh, switches and so on, it's you, it's your body and the app, so everything is based on a swipe or a scroll. 
we think this is a kind of a nice happy medium between flat and skeuomorphic. So these are a couple images from the Warby Parker website, which we had mentioned earlier, uh, the eyewear company, and their new company, Harry's, which is um, the men's shaving accessories. So they really, it, it's not too flat. You don't feel, it doesn't feel cold. It still feels warm and welcoming, uh, but it's also simple. It shows dimension, and the references to the physical world are really used in appropriate places. Um, they, they're only used to get these kind of when they're talking about a real physical object or product image, um, the interactive elements, such as the buttons, are they're larger, which may be influenced, as we know, by kind of uh, mobile interactions. But it really makes it simple and clean and clear. Uh, and they really use these realistic elements from the, the physical world in the right places. So uh, things that evoke, you know, this honest, real. Um, emotion, which we had touched on earlier. Um, and then this is an, another mobile app called the Weather Dial. So it was designed based on industrial designer Diva Ramsey's principles of design. So it really stripped down everything that wasn't needed, um, leaving it with a weather app that was on one screen with no pages, no ads, no distractions, no need to even really push a button at all. Uh, this, again, is kind of a happy medium of, of skeuomorphism. So you see some, some elements of real world switches and buttons, but it, it's, it doesn't detract from the experience. Instead, it, it kind of makes you feel comfortable and, and it makes it easy to use. Um, and this, our next example is Nest, which is really the next generation thermostat. I'm not sure if any of you all have heard of this before. But it was designed by two designers who helped create the iPod and the iPhone. Um, it's a really fantastic product. It remembers what temperatures you like in your home or, or any space you're in. It learns your living patterns and can sense when you're there or not, which helps you manage your energy use and um, you know, be more sustainable and energy efficient. Which, and it can also be controlled over Wi-Fi, so any mobile device. Um, both the interactions of the hardware and the software are just uh, very simple. Um, and intuitive, they, uh, th there's not much room for mistake. You can only, they limit your options to go one way or the other. Um, this, similar to the weather app that we just sh had shown, it really turns this kind of mundane task, such as setting your thermostat or checking the weather, into a fun, engaging, delightful task through the design that they implement. OK, so our next example then is uh, showing a couple different approaches to how a financial services company could be portrayed online. Uh, simple is depicted on the right, whereas TD Bank is pictured on the left. Um, on the TD Bank example, this is kind of what we've grown to expect for a lot of banks out there. It doesn't look all that out of the you know, ordinary or anything shocking about it. It's just kind of a stale approach to how you would present a uh, bank online. And simple is a worry-free alternative to traditional banking that focuses on reinventing personal banking with modern online and mobile experiences. Uh, there's no fees and, you know, surprisingly good customer service. Uh, it's meant to make managing finances finance is easy and simple and straightforward. Uh, it's just a, a great uh, industry that was ripe for disruption, and these guys are taking a swipe at it. And we hope that uh, they succeed in doing so. But their site uh, is does a really good job of applying a lot of these principles that we're talking to. There's a very strong value proposition in over uh, kind of some rich graphics that open the, the page and then a strong call to action to just uh, get started with it that goes into a very simple sign up process. But they use the vertical scrolling as a way to kind of tell the whole story and demonstrate really their approach to uh, fulfilling this promise. Um, 
I'm not going to link over to the site right now just because I think it isn't rendering very well through the webinar, but this is another site that we strongly encourage all of our attendees today to spend a little bit of time on because there's just some really nice design uh, nuances that uh, take place on the site, a lot of nice interaction design um, um, elements on there that are, are really kind of representing a new standard. Here's another example of a couple different ways, kind of a side-by-side -side comparison to uh, present a book for sale. So this is the same book on the left. It's on Amazon. On the right, it's on the publisher's site. This is a, you know, a series of books for web designers that we're fond of uh, from, from the publisher, A Book Apart. Uh, but, you know, Amazon, say what you will about it. People love it. I think everything they love about it doesn't have a whole lot to do with the user experience on on page. You know, there's a lot that could be done to really make this more pleasant, more usable, more consumable. There's a lot. There's just way too many uh, things competing for your attention. You're not really sure where to go with your eye. I mean, there's all kinds of different devices that they're trying to employ to draw the user in and engage them a little more. But you know, our position on this is that it's just heavy-handed and you know, they would really benefit from going through a comprehensive redesign. And it wouldn't even necessarily mean uh, reducing the amount of content. It's just how it's, how it's presented on screen. So the, the publisher's site on the right, um, you know, if, if we were visiting that site and we scrolled down the page, we could see that there is actually quite a bit of content on that page and a lot of the same content types uh, and purposes to those content types as what you would find on a product detail page on the Amazon site. It's just the way it is organized and presented um, feels a lot more consumable, a lot more digestible, and in our belief um, would lend a lot more towards uh, successful metrics. Okay, so Julia is going to talk about this example a little bit and uh, it's, you know, the, the good job it's doing of storytelling. So this is on the insurance site Sherpa, which we had shown briefly earlier. And they're really drawing users in through storytelling methods, um, such as these very simple graphics that display how their service works. And although these may seem unrelated to converting uh, users to customers or, or selling, they really help people feel sure and comfortable and trust their decision they're making to do business with you. So it's really about uh, effectively and simply communicating your offer and your the benefits of using, say, Sherpa, for example, versus another website. So they're, again, using this very human, uh, human language. Uh, we can always, we're here to help you um, spend less uh, weight less, et cetera. So again, um, language, uh, iconography, very uh, flat graphics. Um, they have their, their value statement, just very very clear and large on the page. There's, there's not much to compete with it. It's not overwhelming, say, say from the Amazon site that we just looked at. Um, this is another example of a of another site we think is doing a great job with, with storytelling and, and really being direct with their their product, which is um, Squarespace. Uh, again, big bold graphics, um, simple clear value statement, uh, transparent offerings, which sound very honest and and clear, such as free 14-day trial with 24/7 support, no credit card required. So they're upfront telling telling users what they need and what they can expect. Um, they also throw in what's on screen, so. They have their menu in a collapsible uh, and expandable on the right side, which really helps uh, create this uh, expensive and rich experience where it seems like there's there's not much there and there's room to explore. And kind of a, a trend that's been going on recently with um, designers is, is focusing more on easy to learn versus intuitiveness. So uh, intuitive comes second to a kind of calming and clean experience for the user. 
I know we're running a little short on time here, so I'm going to try to whiz through the, the rest of these examples real quick, and then we can get to our questions. Um, so this is MailChimp. We love MailChimp. Here again, this is a great example of a, a clear value proposition, a strong call to action, which goes to a very simple form, which gad gradually engages you and just makes it feel really easy to sign up. Uh, this is a new app um, that gives you a new way of um, managing your mail. Uh, they, they do a really good job of, um, let me go to the next slide here. One of the things that I really like about that app is this trend we're seeing that is kind of creating perceived exclusivity and anticipation, um, getting you to request an invitation to uh, even download the thing and use it. So we're seeing this more and more uh, as some promotions to really um, generate intrigue in a product. Uh, the screen to the left here is what you would see after you've requested an invitation to uh, download Mailbox. And you have to wait um, until your number is called, basically. So in this example, there's 208,000 people in front of you. But as you open the app and kind of check in on it from time to time to get a status update, you can see that number ticking down. And it's funny how often you'll just sit there and stare at it uh, for a few minutes and watch the numbers go down. So eventually, you'll get an email saying, hey, it's your turn. You can, you can get in there. Um, another uh, app that uses a similar strategy is called Live Surface. That's on the right there seeing more and more of that stuff. Um, Julia, real quick on this slide, what are we about? Uh, So really how uh, layouts can be designed for people to kind of really spend and waste time. So thinking about uh, giving them content that they feel like they're discovering something that create, makes them curious, they want to know what's next. Uh, these curated experiences uh, where you're using kind of algorithms to offer things that interest them or where they can set settings to only to control the experience but create that kind of unknown element so they're really designing for for time Good. and on the interaction design side you know we see more and more of just subtle nuances that are helping elevate the brand experience and create uh, this feeling of just really nice, well-crafted experiences. So on the left-hand side, we're just showing one example of a very simple but very elegant way of uh, uh, handling a search UI. So on its collapse state, there's just a magnifying glass. We all know what that means. You click on it, and then the search field sort of expands from there, and everything around it moves over. And when you exit that search field, it kind of returns to its collapse state, and it's just uh, highly usable and just really nice way of kind of reducing clutter and um, keeping things simple. On the right hand side is just a, a little module found on the IWC watch site and in this uh, for this brand you know precision and how the watch is made and everything is a really uh, center central part of the story so one little device just a nice subtle device that they included is the ability to kind of move that handle right beneath the picture of the watch to the left or the right to expose the inside of the watch and just to see how everything is so beautifully designed on the inside of it. We're seeing more and more real care going into just subtle interactions on sites that are taking it from good to great. So the, the next couple of screens we're going to uh, whiz through is actually an experience that uh, we personally went through. So we documented it to kind of show you here today because we felt it tied together a lot of the points that we've made, uh, ultimately designing for humans. So here, this is um, a project management app uh, designed by the agency Fuzzco. But really, uh, this is their landing page. I get a clear uh, understanding of how they're going to help me, a uh, clear sign up um, email entry. Um, you have to receive an invitation to join, so I felt really it was that element of exclusivity that we've mentioned and um, really uh, human language and flat, simple design. Um, this was their sign-up form to get uh, permission to, to kind of grant access to this. So again, super simple, large field, uh, friendly language, uh, clear contrast call to action button. Um, and then I received this really pleasant message from them 
I felt like they really cared about me as a customer and, and, and joining their service. Uh, and they brought me through and gave me a small tour of it, which I felt like they were really showing me, uh, cared about me again. So as a business, it was, it was, I felt nice. Um, and then this is another step to that. But it really, overall, uh, I ended feeling very good about my decision to join. So that's it. That's what we have for you. We know that we ran over just a few minutes on going through some of those examples, but hopefully it was worth uh, the extra few minutes and got uh, all of you thinking about um, how you may interject some of these principles into your designs to elevate the experience and all with the effort to engage people deeper and increase in conversions. Thank you so much. Well, thank you both. Um, we're going to jump right into Q&A. We've uh, been trying to answer as many questions as we can on the, uh, in the background here since you guys were, were going through things. Uh, and uh, as, as we do that, I'm, I'm just going to let you know uh, our audience is pretty skeptical on a lot of things, so <laughs> I'm just going to hit you with what they have to say. Um, there's um, some of the, the questions that... Um, sorry, let me just get through here. Um, some of the questions that, that we're getting were, well, what if you have some non-sexy, like a business-to-business -business product? You guys cherry-picked a lot of examples of consumer products, physical devices, whether it's a watch or a thermostat dial or an iPad. That's great when you're in the physical world, and of course, all designing people like physical objects. But mm -hmm. on the website, most of us don't deal with physical objects. So what do you do when you don't have, where your primary purpose isn't to have a brand or uh, to sell physical objects? That's a great question. I've spent uh, the majority of my career in the B2B space and I've, you know, had to face that challenge quite a bit. And I think um, the, the need to tell a story is always there. And you've got a choice about how you do that. Do you do it kind of in a boring and expected way or do you really spend some time thinking about it and try to approach it from a little bit of an oblique angle? So a lot of the time when you're not dealing with a physical product, maybe it's more service oriented, especially in the B2B space, um, the concepts might be a little more abstract. So anything you can do to kind of come up with some interesting metaphors that help tell that story can be good. I think avoiding um, stock photography and stock illustration as much as possible uh, is a really important aspect. Of Great. Well, I'm glad you, you brought that up because that's something else that I'm getting slammed on because people know it's, it's, <laughs> against, uh, it's against our uh, best practices. I mean, when you guys, for example, use that, uh, the Target website, and you have the happy mm -hmm. couple in the spring dresses. Uh, I mean, to, to a lot of, from our way of thinking and a lot of the stuff I'm getting from the audience is that that's basically, oh, goody for you. You spent a lot of money on your fall campaign, so you thought you'd slap that same giant photograph on your homepage. Uh, but that doesn't support the conversion picture. It doesn't support the fact that it's a catalog trying to sell stuff and help you navigate. So um, you know, where does... What are the limits of a brand and just using giant photos to establish some kind of ambiance? Yeah, I think what we weren't showing in that example is the rest of the experience that unfolds further down the page. And we did touch on you know, this trend towards long scrollable pages with kind of focused content modules that present one thought at a time. And when they do that, it's really taking you know, advantage of you know, kind of most of the screen real estate as they can. So that target example was kind of the first module in a series that would be um, unfolding a, a bigger story and having lots of elements along the way that engages and is designed to convert. So that, that was their wedding site uh, that we pulled up there. So anybody that wanted to go back and kind of look at that uh, experience in more of a holistic sense might um, start to see how uh, that was a really effective. Well, well and the same thing you were you were talking about pictures of people, but uh, a lot of times uh, on the web, people are extremely impatient. They're not flipping through, you know, cover or a copy of Vogue magazine. They're not enjoying their Pinterest kind of exploration. Uh, to Julia's point, that's something. If you want to spend time discovering long tail stuff, that's wonderful. But most of us want to are on a website to accomplish a specific task. 
So pictures of people, in our experience, often distract from that. Unless that picture directly supports the call to action or draws attention to it, it can actually be a waste of my time and attention because I can't help looking at pictures of people. Sorry, Tim. Uh, some of the other examples we had shown, such as Squarespace, which is a um, either B2C or B2B service really, uh, uses that same bold imagery and doesn't take me any longer to get going. Instead, I feel like I'm embarking on kind of an exciting modern experience. The call to action is still very clear and high contrast. I know where to go. It's easy. It's simple. Um, I don't think necessarily images that means they will take you longer or distract from where you're trying to go. Yeah, and the full bleed image thing, especially as it involves people, I mean, you need to uh, apply those where it makes sense. Sometimes in a B2B environment, it's a nice kind of opening screen to a, a nice concise thought that you want to kind of begin your uh, engagement with. And then as you take people through the uh, content within your site, it can it can get a little more focused and a little you know less image heavy if that's what makes sense. But visuals are you know they can be handled in a number of different ways to help simplify concepts and to help engage in and engage on an emotional level. So maybe in some B two B environments that is better done through some type of infographics or something like that that also are gaining quite a bit of um, popularity for you know, just that reason. That's another example that we didn't include today, but infographics are actually quite huge right now. Tim, did you have more questions? Uh, yeah, before we continue though, I wanted to um, make folks aware of the conversion conference if you're not already. Our next show is coming up April 15th and 16th in San Francisco. We also have Chicago and Boston in the U.S. for later this year and for all of you European travelers, Paris, London, and Berlin. Can't go wrong there. Uh, we have as part of that a couple of special offers. If you're interested in signing up for San Francisco, you can actually get the early bird rate courtesy of Motivate Design. Uh, it just use the code Motivate SF for $400 off of San Francisco. Uh, and if you're interested in our upcoming Chicago and Boston shows, you can see the promo codes there for 200 off. So the San Francisco code is good till the 10th, and the Chicago and, and Boston codes are good through the end of the month. And Tim, I'm going to jump in here and, and say that Motivate SF code does not have a space in between it. So Oops. I don't want anybody to have, run into any problems with that. So just don't put a space when you, in order to get your discount. Um, you can blame that one on Tim. This types you. Uh, and uh, also, if you're interested in having your website reviewed, we have uh, an offer as well, good through the end of next week, $100 off if you met one of our express reviews, if you mention motivate after you buy. Uh, okay, so back to our questions. One of the other um, things that, that people were talking about is this notion of kind of um, the in business to business, of uh, you called it, you know, I, we call it progressive disclosure. I think uh, Tony you used a different word. Um, yeah. yeah, progressive. Engagement. Yeah, gradual engagement. Exactly. I want to explore that a little bit. I think this is goes across both business to business and business to consumer. One of the things that we suggest is definitely asking only for information that you need to complete the current transaction, not the nice to haves, not all the stuff you want to shove into your CRM and start calling me up and harassing me with, but uh, just the minimum information. Ask for less and give more in return. Do you agree with that approach? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, it's often a, a struggle, especially between stakeholders, <laughs> of where that line is, you know, because you've got business needs and you've got user needs and where does it uh, kind of meet in between. But, yeah, I, I generally agree that, you know, you, you just want to make contact with them and you want them to start believing in you and engaging with you and more good stuff will happen over time if you're able to start off on the right foot. So. Okay, and uh, here we have a question uh, about um, kind of high stakes things like a healthcare provider. Uh, their goal is to build trust versus an immediate sale. Uh, so can you talk to that mm -hmm. balance a little bit? 
It's funny, we actually are um, in the middle of doing redesigning a healthcare website now, and uh, trust was definitely a huge factor that we tried to portray and, and get across to the user. We knew that was um, a big one. So again, uh, this was not as sexy of a product or service as, say, the ones that we showed today, but uh, I adopted a lot of those principles into this, so still keeping it uh, using engaging personal imagery that had personality, so understanding who your users are and what will make them feel at home. In this case, it was pictures of the city they were in, uh, but things that they would kind of only get as a member of the city. So uh, it was like a fountain, I believe. Um, but keeping buttons large and form fields large and, and decreasing clutter on the page. There was a lot of white space, which kind of created this airy experience where they felt a little maybe more upscale and trustworthy, um, using calming colors, uh, really simple fonts, uh, a lot of sans serif fonts were used, um, or not a lot, it was one. Uh, trying to think what else. I think well, that's I think it. those are good yeah. points, and yeah, just generally, uh, you know, having a more human, more friendly, more approachable, more open, less confusing design inspires trust. Definitely. Removing extra content that's not needed. No, and then I think, of course, adding explicit trust marks and symbols, uh, various seals of approval, uh, certifications, uh, media mentions, uh, awards, that sort of thing is it can be very, very powerful as well. So don't forget the badges. Yeah, I would, I would be um, a little careful with kind of the extra badges and certifications. Um, use them when and only when necessary because it can feel perhaps a little dishonest. If if it seems like they're trying to trying to sell. Well, if you have the number one cancer oncology success rate, you'd probably want people to know that. Right. That's right. Definitely, definitely. Those patches. Judicious. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so let, let's talk about the business to business. I mean, this was mostly business to consumer stuff. Specific tips for business to business. Well, a lot of it still applies. I think, you know, being simplifying where you can, using uh, human language. Um, you know, I studied in the beginning of my career, a million years ago, I studied advertising for three years with this uh, old guru from San Francisco that uh, was very well known uh, back then. And, you know, a lot of those sound principles of communication, I think, apply just as much in this context as it did uh, you know then and in different media but it's just really talk to people not at them um, really tell them what they want to hear not just what you want to tell them um, so falling back on just proven sound uh, communication principles is really important but uh, some of these more modern uh, design trends I think can help uh, with a B2B environment just as much as it can with, with B2C. Tony, I agree okay, completely. I think, sorry, I just really quickly, a lot of times uh, B2B falls back as kind of like the ugly stepsister of B2C, and it, I don't, I strongly don't think that it has to be that way. You can take a lot of what we talked about today and then implement it in those sites or internal software systems. Yeah, I think that uh, we work quite a bit with B2B clients, and I would say there's some high-level principles. Or one, you need to establish trust in the form of uh, other companies that you work with. Marquee clients are huge for B2B because it's all about covering your butt. So those better be on your homepage. Uh, also, most of them are high-ticket, very high-risk sales or decisions, so don't expect them to get made immediately. That means you need to have downloads and thought leadership and content marketing all over your site to get that email early and to be able to communicate with me over time. So don't focus on the, hey, free demo form fill. Give me the white paper in exchange for my email instead. Oh, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So really thinking about what a good top of funnel offers versus, you know, something the demo would be more middle or kind of bottom of yeah. middle of the funnel where after you've made a connection there. I mean, those are sound principles of good, uh, you know, proactive marketing there. And then, you know, maybe uh, taking a principle that we touched on today just around simplicity and offer them one focused offer at a time, try to make it contextual uh, as much as you can. So the, the, the minimum would be place your call to 
actions for offers on pages where you know the offer relates to the content of the page if possible but if you want to go the extra step and be able to track users behavior and know you know how many times they've converted and use that intelligence to serve up uh, more relevant offers that's all the better